Welcome everyone, this is WeChat, the podcast brought to you by the St. Andrew's Society of Mexico. This is a place of reunion and fun for Scottish culture lovers in Mexico and around the world. We are here to continue the great tradition of this society, founded in 1893. We are your hosts, Tania Fuentes and Alba Sasueta. Welcome to this special episode of WeChat. Charles Rennie Mackintosh was one of Glasgow's brightest sons. He was an architect, designer, watercolorist, and artist who became the main representative of the Glasgow style and Art Nouveau in Scotland. Today we are going to talk about his masterpiece, the Glasgow School of Art. For this special chat, we are accompanied by Professor Alan Hooper, Senior Lecturer at the School of Architecture in Glasgow School of Art. Welcome, Alan. First of all, um, I'd like to thank Tanya for um, giving me the opportunity to speak to the St. Andrew Society of Mexico. Um, my name is Alan Hooper. Uh, I'm a program leader in the Macintosh School of Architecture, um, which is a school within uh, Glasgow School of Art. Um, I'd like to start um, at the end of the story, uh, to start with some sense of loss. And here we have a uh, picture of Macintosh's Glasgow School of Art um, in the throes of a second devastating fire. Um, the day of the fire, the second fire, was the 15th of June 2018, um, which was a particularly important day within Glasgow School of Art because it was actually graduation day. It was the day that the students graduated from the school Uh, at Glasgow University, which is some way away from Glasgow School of Art. But it was a very emotional day without the, the trauma uh, of this um, fire, which has devastated uh, Macintosh's um, masterpiece, which I'll hope to explain. So the idea of showing you that devastation um, is really as a precursor to then say, well, what's the magnitude of the loss? So what I'll try to do over the next 30 minutes or so is try to convey the magic, the mysticism of this wonderful piece of architecture. Um, and like all great works of art and architecture, it's the combination of a particular person, an artist, an architect, in a particular place. And I think that this building, Glasgow School of Art, grows from that location, Glasgow at the turn of the 20th century, and a very young architect who actually graduated from the school uh, being the author uh, of the new home uh, for the School of Art. Glasgow itself um, is a very interesting place in terms of its geological foundation. So the city sits on a valley. Um, there's a river, the River Clyde, some of you may know, runs through the middle of the city. And on the north side in particular, 
there is a very rigid gridiron plan within which the Glasgow School of Art is located. On the top of Garnet Hill, which is one of the small hills which we call a drumlin, which was actually created by glaciation around 10,000 years ago. And from that kind of that beginning with the landscape, the city develops uh, initially through the, the rise of industry, um, through the shipyards, um, developing to a point where um, Glasgow uh, produced uh, the significant tonnage of all the ships in the world that uh, were produced. Um, a huge percentage were coming from this rather small city at the time in Glasgow. Um, so we have a heritage, a legacy of both the archaeology, the topography, the Victorian 18th, 19th development of the city, and we still see the remnants of these uh, developments within the city. So the shipbuildings there is now past, that industry has died off, but the remnants are still visible to us. And we also have these fantastic buildings that are built during the early period of Glasgow's expansion when the economy was driven by, first of all, cotton and then tobacco, and as I've mentioned later, the industrialization through shipbuilding. The building itself, uh, Glasgow School of Art, was built in two phases. That wasn't intended when Macintosh won the competition and the intention was to build it in one phase. But the cost of the design was more than the school had in terms of its finances. So a decision was made to build half the school and seek the finances to build the second half of the school. Now, in architectural terms, this is highly significant because the gap between the first phase and the second phase allowed Macintosh to rework the second phase of the building, which was built some 10 years later. Um, so in the interim period, the first phase, the east side of the art school was built and used for a range of purposes, not always intended, um, to accommodate the needs in essentially half the building. So we had situations where the gallery became a studio. So there's a certain flexibility within the building that allowed it to be inhabited in a number of ways. The main meeting room became a studio also. So the building has the ability to adapt and is flexible enough to accommodate uh, a range of uh, uses beyond those that were the original intention. But to go back to the phasing, so the first phase of Glasgow School of Art was built in 1896-1899. Um, the building was originally designed uh, complete, but there was not enough um, money to build the building in one go, so it was split into two phases. Um, this was actually beneficial for Macintosh because it allowed him a 10-year period between the first phase and the second phase of the project. Um, and that the difference is really expressed most clearly in the two gables of the building rather than in the front facade. So when you look at the east facade of the building, you see a historicist building. You see a facade that's reaching back into the past of, Glasgow, uh, of Scotland. Um, it's looking at the traditional vernacular buildings, heavy walls, deep recesses. So it's a, a facade that's, that's really... Um, signalling the past culture of Scottish architecture. Conversely, when you go to the West Gable, you see a building that's looking forward. That's what's been described as a proto-modern gable, um, a building that has entered the 20th century. So if the first gable is built at the end of the 19th century, the second gable is built at the beginning of the 20th and is very much a building that is echoing um, the architecture that's growing through Europe at the time and also referencing the development of uh, architecture in North America uh, at the same time uh, in the work of people like Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan. So what has been a problem in terms of the finances uh, of building the art school has in fact become an opportunity that allows this young architect, Charles Rennie Macintosh, to develop his style, 
to embrace a new modern architecture that's sweeping uh, across North America and Europe uh, at the time. So in terms of the West Gable, um, it's essentially a stack of functions. At the lowest level, you have the lecture theatre. Um, above that, you have the architecture studio. Uh, and then above the architecture studio, you have the world famous Macintosh Library, which we'll talk about uh, in coming up. And then above that, you have the fine art studio. But in terms of the library, it's interesting that the library has also got a built-in bookstore that sits directly above the library where the book collection is held um, for the library itself, uh, which is a very interesting space uh, in its own right. Uh, there's also beautiful little moments uh, on that west end of the building. Um, there's a little cantilevered greenhouse where the school would grow flowers that would then be taken into the adjacent studio where the artist would paint the flowers. And it's this wonderful little, what architects describe as cantilevered. So actually sits out over the city uh, and grows these very delicate flowers that are then transported into the studio where the artists can uh, produce their artwork in relationship to them. Um, so essentially, my talk is in two parts. There's a part that is exploring the attraction, the uh, what I'd call the enduring appeal uh, of the building before the fire. Um, and then there's the life of the building after the fire. Um, so I think any discussion of this building in the future will always have to acknowledge these both lives of the building. Um, the fire not being insignificant in terms of um, an understanding of the building, in terms of the emotional appeal of the building, which we will explore a bit later. Um, the title for the talk um, comes from essentially two men. <laughs> One um, from the book, The Ways of Seeing. So when I talk about seeing Macintosh, I'm referencing the book by John Berger. And the other book that's been very influential is uh, a book that has an essay by my old professor, Andy McMillan, um, which talks about the Macintosh building as a modern enigma. Um, the fact that it feels at one point very, very enriched through its, the experiences of the building, but it's also quite a uh, um, solid, um, it's not overly decorative building that has a certain seriousness to it, but it's also has incredible joy through the spaces that are created within the building. So the, the title, as I say, relates to these two, two influential people in my life, in my work. Um, but what ties both these men together is that they see art and architecture as living. They're interested in how the past and the present meet. So John Berger in his book talks about the present and the past in terms of using um, the present to kind of interrogate the past and vice versa. And Andy McMillan looks at the Macintosh building as a lesson for contemporary architects. So it's not something that's historicist and sits in the past. Uh, it's not about heritage. It's really about a living artifact that we can learn from. So I think these two you know, artist and write, uh, architect and writer have a very similar uh, approach to the role of art and architecture within our lives. And this is when I was still working within the building before the fire, we set up a project with digital design students who are using computers to explore the space. We actually made their studio in the library, which was unheard of because the library had become um, slightly mothballed because it was so precious that people were, in hindsight, um, people were very precious about the library itself, but we were quite keen that it should still be used, it sh should still be a working space. So we set up studio in the library for two weeks and we worked with digital design students to explore projection and uh, digital interventions within the library itself to explore the meaning and the spatial qualities of the library. So part one of the, the talk really brings up this notion of alchemy. Um, 
it's not well known, but um, Sir Christopher Wren, the architect of St Paul's Cathedral, was actually an alchemist um, with many of his contemporaries. And their idea was their idea of alchemy was to transform base metals into gold and become the Jeff Bezos of their day. Um, Another meaning of alchemy is to take things and to put them together and create something which is mysterious and magical. And I'd like to take the second definition uh, in which to look at this work of art, work of architecture by Charles Rennie Macintosh. And I'd like to explore Macintosh's architectural alchemy uh, under three headings. So I'd like to talk about alchemy in relationship to how the building is arranged on the site. I like to explore alchemy in terms of the spatial richness uh, within the building. And I'd also like to explore the alchemy in terms of the fabric, how the building is constructed, the materials that are used and how they are put together. Um, so if we start with the building arrangement, what we have is to the north facade, we have very large windows facing north and um, which are ideal for studio space because in the Northern Hemisphere, the sun rises and sets in the south, rises and east sets in the west, but it's predominantly from the south. So the north is reflected light, which is what artists need in terms of having a steady, constant light to paint. Conversely, on the other side of the building facing south, the building has lots of very small windows, which actually modulate the strong south light and create spaces of a great variety. So while on the north, it's a working space, on the south, it's a space for enjoying light where the building absorbs the light through a whole variety of different window types that bring the light into the interior of the building that then Macintosh uses for the purposes of atmosphere and creating a range of spaces. So as I say, the north light the north side of the building is a working space. You could relate it to a factory where people actually need a quality of light where they actually can produce artefacts in this case. Conversely, in the south, it's about relaxation, it's about community, it's about conviviality, it's about sharing time with people. And the spaces on the south side of the building offer a huge variety of space for such interaction to take place. When you look at the plan of the building, you can see right down the middle of the building, there is a large spine wall. That large spine wall reinforces what I've been talking about in relationship to the two types of space. On the north side, you have the studios, and on the south side, you have the supporting spaces. So you have the primary meeting room, you have the library, and of course you have the gallery, the arrival hall where you move in and experience the first uh, initial part uh, of the building on the north side of that spine wall divide. Um, the building is also very clever in the way that it uses its topography. So the building sits on a hill and you get access into the main entrance by coming up a flight of steps. But equally, you can move around the side of the building, which gives you what's called universal access into the lower part of the building, which leads to the lecture theatre, which was used outside the actual working day of the art school. So when the art school was largely close to um, the studios, the lecture theatre was open for evening lectures, uh, et cetera. So the building had a much longer um, use throughout the day than simply when the classes were organised um, for the students. And these two entrances are very important. So the first entrance, the primary entrance up this grand flight of steps, but equally there's a, another beautiful entrance, which is on the west side uh, of the building, which, as I say, gives you direct access to this lecture theatre, which had a public function. Um, the building, in terms of its environmental services, was also very important at the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. It had a, this large spine wall, which not only was spatial in terms of separating the north side of the building from the south side of the building, it also held all the services. So 
the electrics, which were very new for that period of time, were included in this wall. The plumbing was included in this spine wall, but also really importantly, it was a plenum ventilation system, which both ventilated and heated the building, which is a genius solution to working with an art school where artists are using paint, oil paints and lots of um, chemicals that release um, gases and vapours. So as well as heating the building at the same time as by using this plenum system, um, it was also ventilating the building naturally. So the hot air would rise through, it would heat up the studios at the lower level, that air would rise back into ventilators that would then be expelled from the top of the building. So what you see here is a combination of an element, this spine wall, which is spatial in terms of the use of the, the building. It's also to do with the different qualities of light within the building, but it also functions as an environmental um, element within the building as well. So like, all great architecture, it does two or three things at once. It's not simply a series of approaches and episodes. It's actually doing everything at the one time, which is part of, in my opinion, the genius uh, of the building. Um, but the most kind of instant kind of um, appeal of the building obviously lies in the spatial richness, in the variety of spaces within the building the quality and the atmosphere of these spaces, which I think is largely down to how Macintosh uses daylight within the building. And that's what I'd like to kind of explore with you. Um, from the very bottom of the building, he uses roof lights so that when you're in the basement in the lower part of the building, in the hill, um, you don't feel as though you're in a confined space. You're still aware through top story lighting of what kind of day it is outside. You're still connected through um, these openings to the world beyond and to the daylight that enters the space. Um, the circulation spaces, in particular the main staircase, is a wonderful piece of architecture that invites you to linger in the space as you encounter it, as you move up through the building. Um, again, the use of roof lights, the light is coming from above, which is offered as an invitation to move vertically um, through the building. The main arrival space is both a gallery and a reception hall. So it's like a reference back to the baronial hall in Scottish houses, um, where this functions both, as I say, as a reception, but it's also a place to exhibit. So the perfect combination for an art school, a place to mingle, a place to meet, a place to chat, a place to encounter some wonderful art. Um, and I think that's the, the heart of the building for people who are coming and engaging with the students and staff at Glasgow School of Art. Um, there's also the director's room, which sits directly above the front door. So it's a bit like the captain of the ship so when you enter the front door, you look up and you see the director's office directly above you. And I think that's really, really important, that that relationship to the director, who in the early years of the school was always an artist um, and they had their studio above. So I think that's a kind of very symbolic gesture that the person who's running the school is there. You can see their office, you know where they are. Um, and I think that's... Uh, a beautiful move about accountability, about accessibility for that person who's leading the school. Um, none of the circulation spaces could simply be called circulation spaces. They're all incredibly rich. So the passage that leads from the reception arrival gallery space to the library um, is a space that has places to sit, um, what are called settles, which are on the south wall gathering the south light, and it's a place to sit and have a chat. And my experience of Glasgow School of Art is that those spaces were much loved and used. Every time I would go to the library, there was always students sitting, chatting, enjoying um, the view south over Glasgow, but also enjoying um, the south light as it penetrates into that space. The circulation spaces, the passages, the movement spaces are generally dark, 
And the reason they're dark is to absorb the light. So when the light comes in, it doesn't bounce all over the place. It's really held within the space. And you really get to understand the space in terms of light and shadow and a kind of chiaroscuro effect uh, of this light, this south light, strong light coming into the building. And then, of course, there's the library itself, this wonderful dark um, space where you're never entirely sure where it starts or stops. So it has this amazing capacity to, when more people come in, it opens up, and when people disappear, and you go down to one or two people studying in the space, it seems to contract. It's truly a kind of magical effect. And I think that, again, is to do with the fact that they use a very dark um, palette of colour and materials within the library, but also the quality of light that is constantly changing, particularly being on the west side of the building. As the sun starts to set, the, the, the light level within the library starts to drop imperceptibly until you find yourself reading your book uh, in almost darkness with the this task lighting that allows that um, reading to continue. Um, throughout this, the building, there are moments of great beauty um, within the circulation spaces, how the stairs work, um, how moments have been taken um, where um, the on the east stair, there was an additional stair put in, but where that stair sits on the original, what would have been an outside wall, the windows are incorporated within the stair. So you experience the phasing of the building in a poetic way. So you pass on one of the stairs, you pass by projecting windows that actually were originally external windows that have now become part of the building. And the architect takes the opportunity to enjoy that moment, which I think is very special. Um, the building, as I say, has a variety of spaces. So you've got very tall, toplit spaces. You have very tight, very small passageways that are incredibly atmospheric, timber floors, timber walls. When you walk along, they creak and they move. They have small windows that allow the light to come in to penetrate and create these very sort of um, atmospheric, as I say, a chiaroscuro effect of light and shade. And that changes as you move through, um, through the building. And then you have other spaces, the famous, what's called the Hen Run, which was an additional space that was added in phase two of the building, which is virtually a platform that looks out over Glasgow on the south side. So it feels like a greenhouse. It's completely exposed. It cantilevers out over the, um, the spine wall and is quite a daring space to enter, which looks out over the city. But I think the key thing is the sequence of spaces. So there are the spaces themselves are wonderful, but for me, the real genius in the building is how Macintosh puts those spaces together as a sequence. And that's what I'd like to kind of explore um, in the next section of the talk, which is a sequence of spaces that goes from the entrance door all the way up to this very special space titled the Hen Run, which looks over the city where you feel you're almost outside the building. So it's a kind of sequence of spaces that I'd like to talk through that really works one on the other, because as we know, architecture works sequentially. You know, what you experience in one room influences how you respond to the next. So if we start with the entrance to the building, the main entrance, we have this wonderful staircase, which is very accommodating. So it's more than a staircase. It's actually a place. It's a place where people congregate. It's a place where people sit and chat. It's where people stop. It's where old friends meet up. It's where there are... Uh, encounters as people are brought into the building through this wonderful kind of curvilinear staircase, which brings you up to this very narrow doorway where you enter into the building itself. So experientially, it's more than simply a way to enter the building. It's actually a place of great character in itself and engenders the what we might term as loitering, hanging about, waiting, you know, meeting people informally, all these kind of 
things are nurtured by this particular staircase and this approach to the building. And then once you move through that doorway, you come into the most wonderful vaulted foyer, uh, which has a bay off to the left-hand side where you can actually stop in your journey. Again, you can meet people, you can chat, you can wait for people. So if you're meeting somebody at the school, you can meet in this space if they arrive early or whatever. So that's a place to stop and meet. But the, 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 the sequence from the entrance leads you to this fantastic view through the foyer to the primary staircase, the main staircase, which connects you up into the gallery space or the museum as um, that space is termed. But that is really the reception space. And you come from a, a slightly darker space. You see the light coming from above and you proceed towards this wonderful staircase which winds up into um, this incredible baronial style hallway, which is, as I say, the gallery in the museum. And that's top lit, so there are no windows. So your focus is on the art. It's a gallery after all. It's a place to exhibit. And so you, you encounter the artwork, the heart of the school in this very convivial social space, which is at the heart of the building. It's in the middle of the plan, but it's also in the middle of the section. So it sits plumb center in the building itself. And that's where you encounter both people and art in a wonderful sort of combination. And from that space, if we continue the sequence, we then enter into the passage heading west towards the library, where I've mentioned before, they have what's called settles, which is window seats where students, visitors, staff can sit and have a chat while looking out over the city. Um, it's by no accident that these sitting, these window seats are en route to the library, where you can go to the library, pick up a book and come back and sit in your own little space while reading your book and contemplating the city that's laid out before you. Also a place of casual encounter. So for me, if you were to term this as a corridor, I would argue it's the best corridor in the world um, in terms of both its atmosphere, but how it accommodates you. What my professor described very simply as the niceties of space. The fact that it's an accommodating space, a space you want to stop in, you want to you know, move through slowly, or in fact, take a seat and enjoy um, the space for a longer period of time. And that leads you into the library. So in some ways, the passage becomes a preparation for the experience of the library. Um, and then when you come into the library, you're into its own complete world. Um, it's geometrically, um, materially, and in terms of quality, like uh, a magical space. It's been described as a clearing in a woodland um, because a lot of the structure is vertical. So you could read it as a series of trees Scotland being a very wooded country, so we understand the nature of woods and clearances uh, within those woods, uh, the type of spaces and the type of light that is generated. So it becomes a place for contemplation, you know, a place for engagement with books uh, in a different way from the engagement with books in the corridor, in the passageway, where it's much more social. This is a place where you, you commune with um, the printed word and also, you know, um, folios of drawings and paintings. And it allows for us a concentration, which I think is quite remarkable. Um, and then from the, the library, you progress up and you find yourself at the top of the building. And this is where I think Macintosh plays a, a game with you, with your perceptions. Because when you get to the top of the building, you discover a loggia, which is a series of very heavy vaulted bricks, um, brick vaults, which actually you would expect in the bottom of the building. It feels like it should be in the bottom of the building, almost in a kind of basement cellar kind of experience. But he plays this trick of putting the weight at the top of the building and makes this most wonderful series of loggia spaces um, which sit outside the professor's studios. So in some ways, it's a, it becomes a social space where students can, in a more informal sense, meet with the professors of the school, which I think is a kind of wonderful idea of a community 
of creative people working together and sort of breaking down the hierarchy between staff uh, and students. And after you come through this big heavy loggia, which suggests you're in the bottom of the building, you're projecting into this greenhouse, which floats above the building and overlooks the city, which affectionately is termed as the hen run, which relates back to a Scottish colloquialism, which is a hen is a Scottish name for a young woman. Um, and the reason it's called the hen run is because the women's studio um, was on one side of the building and the, the toilets were on another side. And this passage was used to access the toilets from that studio. And it was so when the women would use that passageway, that's why it was called the hen run. So it has a kind of, you know, there's a historical kind of uh, definition to that, the use of that term. But it's also, for me, it's a hen run, but it's also a place for sun where you can actually escape from if you're working in the studio and you want just a bit of time to commune with nature, it's a warm day, you can go up into the hen run and just take a bit of time to yourself. So it's functioning both as a means of circulation, but like with the rest of the building, it's also a place in its own right. So the final kind of part of Macintosh's alchemy um, I'd like to talk about is in the making of the building, what architects term the construction, um, the fabric of the building. And this is where Macintosh shows his ingenuity in terms of making. So for instance, in the basement of the building, there is a sculpture studio and the sculpture studio has a very beautiful um, timber roof, but the brackets that hold the roof up are very ordinary brackets that have been treated to Macintosh's artistic kind of license. So the brackets themselves were very ordinary pieces of steel. But what Macintosh did is he got the blacksmiths to warm up the steel and then start to work in it with their hands, with their tools, with hand tools, to then make these very special brackets. Now, every bracket is different. It's individual, but it starts off for a very basic piece of steel. So in some ways, he's playing this game of mass production because he's in you know, the 20th century. So it's a city of shipbuilding, a city of industry, as I say, a city of mass production. But what he's doing is he's, he's putting handcraft into that as well. So he's mixing this notion of prefabrication and arts and crafts. So he's bringing the past and he's bringing the future and he's putting the two things together in a very meaningful uh, and very beautiful way. So if you get a chance to, if we re, um, rebuild the building, you've got a chance to, it's one of those kind of little moments to seek out just these little brackets that are an expression of two centuries, the looking back to the arts and crafts and looking forward to prefabrication in the 20th century. Um, and also in the roof, the roof structure, the roof trusses that uses roof lights throughout the building. And every time we have a roof truss, they are different. So there's a, a moment to take the opportunity to take something that's pragmatic, that is you know, structural, but to imbue it with a, an artistic kind of overlay and an artistic intent to explore the beauty of the thing for, for itself. Keeping up the roof is one thing. Here's an opportunity to make patterns, to explore materials, to look at how things come together. Um, so taking those opportunities at every uh, time in the building. So I hope I've conveyed the alluring and the enduring appeal of the building. The next part of the talk is, is a bit more difficult. I don't think it's really something that we can talk about in words. So I'll, I'll be showing a series of images that if you get a chance to look at, I think sort of speak for themselves. But the images uh, are from the first fire that was uh, on the 23rd of May, 2014. And in some ways they convey the emotional um, impact of this devastating fire on a building that was much loved by people, not just within Glasgow, not just within Scotland, but across the world. As soon as the fire broke out and became news, my phone was ringing from all over the world for people who were 
concerned about the level of the fire, etc. So I think it really starts to convey um, the impact of this building on people, which for myself, I'd n- never fully understood until the fire itself, that you realise just how much, how emotional you can actually feel about something as inert as a building made of stone, glass and steel. Now, now that you mention it, I remember that moment. Uh, I was back in Mexico by then. I was working. I was at the office. And one of my friends from Glasgow called me and, uh, and told me, uh, have you heard the news? And I was like, no, what news? The school is on fire. And I started crying. But like this indescribable, I don't know, I was unconsolable. And uh, people that were sitting next to me at the office were like, are you okay? And I was like, no, I'm not okay. I need to, I need to leave. And they were like, did someone die? And I was like, yeah. You know, I, I had that feeling as, as if a relative had died. It was like so horrible. And, and I was just like crying nonstop. And I couldn't describe that feeling. And they were like, but it's just a building. And I'm like, no, it's not just a building. You know, it, I, I don't know. I was just like, yeah, having that feeling of grief. And I, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, you're right. There's no words for it. I think I think bereavement is is the right word because it did feel like that. It felt like there was something that was living had actually passed. Um, so I think it, the analogy of you know, uh, you know uh, bereavement uh, I think is is appropriate. Um, being a man, it took me a day before the tears came, but and it was in the shower. I remember um, actually feeling that full emotion of the impact of, of that tragic event. And it was interesting that as the event was unfolding, very quickly people were actually starting to make art in response to it. And I think this is a really interesting thing that we've explored through the school is how creative people actually respond to trauma. And what they tend to do is they tend to use their art to actually explore and repair themselves in relationship to to these events. So there was a whole outpouring of artworks that were in relationship to that emotional trauma that um, the the school community uh, had experienced. But the the devastation was, you know, plain for all to see. I think the problem was that the biggest devastation was in the library, which was really the jewel in the crown. So that was the piece of the library, the piece of the building that was kind of iconic and that was more or less destroyed in the first fire, which was very, very disturbing. Um, So when the fire occurred, there was two fundamental questions. The first one is, should we rebuild it? Can we rebuild it? You know, is it appropriate to try and recreate a masterpiece? You know, do you end up making a pastiche, a copy which in some ways devalues the original. Um, So there was a lot of soul searching, um, a lot of questioning, uh, a lot of debate, a lot of discourse. But in the end, um, we decided that yes, you can. It was a very um, well-documented building. If you think about the nature of architecture, an architect designs a building, they put information together and somebody else builds it. So you could argue that we had more information than Macintosh had when he started the original building. So the argument was one that we should rebuild the building and that process started, there was an architect and there was a competition. Um, Local architect firm won the competition, which is great. It's people in Glasgow working on this Glasgow icon. And they started the process of um, how to do this, you know, how to recreate this masterpiece. So they had a very clear methodology. We started with thinking of the building as a whole and then thinking of the building as a series of rooms and then thinking of those rooms as a series of pieces uh, all the way down to the getting the right types of nails that were used in the original building. So there was a fantastic, rigorous methodology about how you go about restoring a building of this quality. Um, so the idea was to rethink things, to reconstruct the drawings, to remake the parts. At each point, there's a review. Is this right? Are we doing the right thing? Have we got the right information? And then there was a period of prototyping, trying things out, 
making things off-site to see if it was right in terms of the perception of the assembled piece, particular piece of the building. And then, of course, the restoration of the whole building itself. And we were very lucky in that an ex-student, when he was a student at the school, had made an extensive survey of the library for a publication. So there was a book was been written back in the 80s, um, and this student had been employed to measure up the library in great detail, and he still had all these drawings. So they, they were invaluable in terms of recreating the building. Um, likewise, the school put an appeal out to anyone who had any photographs of the building at all and to send them in. And that became this huge repository that the design team would go through endlessly looking for specific views of the building in relationship to specific details and challenges. So it was an incredibly rigorous, systematic process, forensic in its nature, to establish what we knew about this building and how we could recreate it. Um, so that took the form of drawings. Uh, we also made a digital model. So there's a three-dimensional model in complete form that we could look at how the different parts of the, the building went together. Uh, we made scale models, prototypes, so looking at parts of the building, how they're assembled, um, making sure that the proportions are all absolutely right. So you make the prototype model and then you make it at full size. So we actually, the school um, hired a warehouse in Edinburgh um, because that's where the craftsmen were. And they actually built a full-size bay of the library, absolutely to detail, one-to-one, -one, uh, exploring all the details and how they would go together. So very systematic. And it was fantastic to engage craftspeople in this process because they're vital to the realisation. And they became entranced by Macintosh as well. They were under the Macintosh um, uh, allure you know, they were entranced by this architect and the work that he produced because they were working, they were discovering it through their hands, through making. Um, and there's a whole new generation of um, craftspeople engaged uh, with this building. Um, and it's quite interesting to see the workshop, to see people in the, you know, the 21st century actually making uh, this building, remaking this building and using traditional craft um, processes, picking up some of the really beautiful um, details that are, you know, unlike anything else in any other building. And what was really interesting is that one of the craftspeople who were working on it, they found that the, it was the youngest person in the team who was actually the most adept at carving in the Macintosh style. So there was something quite wonderful about that. It wasn't the aged carpenter. It was the young Carpenter who had just qualified, who actually found that he was actually the most adept at making the decorative parts of the building, which I found quite, quite incredible. Um, so we went through that process of the first fire. Um, we then started the reconstruction, and I was going to give a talk in China about um, the building. So I thought it'd be worthwhile revisiting the building the day before I left, just to give a very up to date account of where we were in the restoration process. So that was in March, 2018. So I took a series of photographs, which were incredible. Um, you can start seeing the building coming back together, coming back to life um, from the devastation, um, glimpses of a building site becoming the building again, um, which was very, very moving, particularly in terms of the structure, the roof structure in the West, um, studio, which uses a Japanese form of carpentry. Um, to see that come back to life was so inspiring. Um, so I remember taking those photographs, being really excited because I thought the talk will be about the wonderful building, the devastation of the fire, but Phoenix like here is the building coming back to life. And everyone was very, very excited. We had an opening day uh, based on the, um, the school calendar. So the 16th of September would be when we were going to reopen and introduce the building to a whole new generation of students. Um, and of course, on the 15th of June, graduation day, the second fire occurred. 
this time, the devastation was tenfold than the first fire. Um, so since that fire, we still were looking for the causes. We're still trying to understand how the fire spread, which of course takes you into the realm of insurances and you know what's available to rebuild the building. So unfortunately, that's where we are. We are at the point where the building is uh, made safe, it's uninhabited, it's a shell. Um, so it sits there as a memory, as, as a prompt, um, and we wait to see what happens with bated breath. However, the, the Scot in me, the Glaswegian in me, knows that we will bring this building back, that this building isn't finished. It can't be finished. It means too much to the city. It means too much to the country. And I think it means too much to the world of architecture because anyone who has an interest in architecture um, could not be other than moved by this building. So I think we have restored part of it once. I think we now have the methodology, we have the knowledge, we have the information um, to rebuild this wonderful masterpiece again. And I'm sure in my heart of hearts that we will actually do that. So there is no like immediate plan, right? I'm still waiting for... The plan is that we are putting a case together to um, the funding body so that we can use a mixture of new funding and insurance money to then reconstruct the building and rebuild it. But obviously at this point in time, nothing is certain. That's a process that must we must go through. Um, but for me, I think the importance of the building um, will in the end ensure that it does come back to life and there'll be a whole new generation of architects and jewelers and painters and printers and you know textile students will will get to enjoy the marvels of this building as will the flocks of people who come from across the world so it's a kind of typical scottish story of um heartbreak and mysticism and magic um all encapsulated in one building um but i think it will come back to life I really hope so. I really, really hope so. And I, I don't know, because I've done like try to do, do some research on what's going to happen, but I can't find anything on the news. So now that you tell me that there's like this uncertainty, I can understand why. But I really, really hope that you can restore it once more to its original glory, because it's, um, as you say, uh, a jewel. Uh, so it would be a shame to get it, you know, let it get lost forever. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, it is, I keep talking about it. It is a, it's a very Scottish story. It was um, Macintosh was a very young architect. Um, he didn't build very many buildings. This was his masterpiece. And this happens to the one that, be the one that we've lost. Um, so it has a, a, you know, it has a, a tinge of tragedy to it, but I do think it will come back. I think there's no way that Glasgow School of Art will let this building go. Um, I don't think Glasgow will let it go. And I don't think the architectural community across the world will let it go. And we can rebuild it. It's entirely possible. We've proven that uh, in the, the rebuilding that had taken place before the second fire. And is there like a fundraising campaign or something like that? that yeah, yeah, there are there is a fundraising campaign. Um, I think to be honest, that after the first fire, there was a great outpouring of support. I think the second fire that becomes more difficult, and also this the second fire was much more devastating. So the question of rebuilding is you know much more significant. I think we're really at, we're now back to a shell, whereas the first fire was really concentrated in the west end of the building. On the east end of the building, there was smoke damage, but no fire damage. Whereas this fire has, you know, devastated the whole building. Yeah, it's such a tragedy. But I remember when I heard about the second fire, my reaction was like completely different. Like this time I was, I was mad. I was like, how could this happen again? You know, it, was, it wasn't sadness this time. It was like rage and like, no, no, this can't be happening again. 
you know, it was like surreal. I, I couldn't even believe it. It's like, no, there's no way this can be happening again. It's too tragic. Um, yeah. I think, I think you're right. I think the, the general feeling was um, upset in the first fire and the second fire there was, you know, how can this happen again? But I think the explanation is quite straightforward is that building sites are very um, risky, dangerous places because of lots of different types of um, potentially risky activities take place. Um, so, you know, it's not unusual for fires to occur within building sites. That's, you know, it can be quite commonplace because of the nature of the processes. And the problem you have when you're working in a building of this type, while you're trying to put in um, fire protection for when the building's complete, you can't make the building fire protected while you're building it, because otherwise you'd be protecting it, taking it apart to build the next bit and then protect. So it's a very, very complex um, sequence of events and I think you know in the end it was unfortunate that and, I, and I, you know this occurred and it, it got to the point where it really devastated the building but as I say it's from the it wasn't a functioning art school at that point the art school had handed over ownership to the contractor and inevitably it you know, the responsibility of the building becomes the contractors, you know, contractually. Um, but they are inherently risky spaces and we were unfortunate in that this occurred. And, you know, because the buildings opened up in terms of its reconstruction, the fire immediately spread um, much quicker than had it been in a different, you know, had it been occupied. And I think that was part of the, the devastation well but but there's hope there's hope there's always hope when it's in relationship to something as beautiful uh, and as meaningful as this building yeah exactly like the the heritage and its meaning i think that that will never die right we we, we have as you say the photographs and everything and and i think the most valuable thing is the design itself, you know, the idea of how to put everything together, how the spaces flow, how he conceived everything in his mind. That's like the piece of art itself, right? Like the concept of it, not the physical yeah. thing. So yeah, well, that can't be taken away. <laughs> no, I think that's right. I think that, as you say, Tanya, the, the, the genius is in the design, yeah? We can, we can take that genius, we have the information, we have the means, and we can reconstruct it and make that, that design genius a piece of artifact, a built, you know, a built artifact, um, a building that can be enjoyed. And I've got, I have no doubts. After the first fire, I had some doubts. Could we reconstruct this? I have absolutely no doubts now that this building could be completely reconstructed and people can walk in and they can see what Macintosh envisaged. Oh, and previously when you were talking about uh, its magic, I was thinking, you know, I was reliving you know, my, my time there and walking through the halls. And I remember my favorite thing was to discover these tiny surprises, like the hidden details, you know, like the stained glass in the door or the, the elements of nature hidden in, in, the, in the gate, you know, the, the, the flowers and the seeds yeah. and the bugs and all these tiny details. I, I, I felt that they were just, uh, I don't know, like magical. Like you could uh, try to just walk around and discover all these new things every time you go by. I'm like, oh, I hadn't seen that. And, and you know, just be, <laughs> uh, I don't know, marveled by, by all these tiny details. And I, I think that's very uh, amazing. Yeah. I think there's, I mean, if I go back to my professor's description of the building as a paradox of enrichment and reduction, in some ways the building is quite plain when you look at it. Some people describe the facade as a factory with these big windows. But the beauty of it is the enrichment is these little moments that you talk about, Tanya, when you walk in, when, you know, the front door, the hand plate, mm -hmm. the, the coloured glass, um, the way that the the handrails, the balustrades, um, the lights, um, every part of the building, there's little moments 
within the building that just, you know, engage you. Um, and I think that, you know, that's the magic of the building is these, you, you, there's a, an element of discovery. It doesn't reveal itself immediately. Mm. Each time you go back to the building, it repays your visit because you discover something else. Some, as you say, a little, you know, a window somewhere or a tiny door that leads to a very particular space. And then the sequence of how they work together, how you move from one to the other to the next. Um, and because it's a very simple plan, um, you can actually you can move through the building in lots of ways. You know, you can come in through the front door and go along the ground floor corridor up to the top of the building, along the top and back. That you know, the, the organization of the building, the arrangement is such that you can explore it. It's not a linear building. There's many ways to encounter the spaces within the building, and each time you do that, you have a different reading uh, of the building itself. Yeah, that's great. I have a, a, another question for you that's been, uh, it's from my dad, you know, as I told you, he's an architect and he wants to know more about the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright, well, Macintosh's influence on Frank Lloyd Wright's work, because he says that he's seen some influence, uh, especially on the Robbie house. So who yeah. influenced whom? <laughs> well, interesting. I mean, I'm not a historian. So I'm an architect, and I think that the way that architects, what I was trying to say at the start, but architecture being a living art form, um, I, I think that we're always looking for um, not the historic, not like, I'm less interested in who influenced the other person, which way around it was, but marvelling at what we can learn from Macintosh in the same way that Frank Lloyd Wright is another genius, you know, um, and there's also, I think it's more of a historian's kind of like who did what and where. Whereas I tend to, my view is I tend to look at these things as living, as contemporary lessons for architects. So these wonderful pieces of architecture that endure sit there as a lesson for us as contemporary architects. What can we learn from looking at that? So I'm, I'm not the best person to answer your question because... Um, as an architect, I'm, I'm always looking at it from a practical, from a kind of useful mm -hmm. perspective, as opposed to a chronological. I would probably say that um, Macintosh influenced Frank Lloyd Wright, but I'm sure there'd be lots of um, American historians would argue quite the opposite. But I think they were contemporaries; they were working around at the same time. What is interesting is that Macintosh had a very small body of work, whereas Frank Lloyd Wright had an enormous body of work. Um, Macintosh worked, you know, practically on his own. He worked in a firm, Kepi uh, Henderson, which is when he designed the art school. But very quickly, he was working with his wife. There was a group of them, four artists, the, um, uh, his wife and his, uh, his wife's husband, his, uh, his sister's husband. So there was a group of four who formed a kind of art, uh, art collective. So... Macintosh is very, very different in terms of how he produced his architecture, whereas Frank Lloyd Wright, as you know, people know he had a huge office or a much larger office and produced a huge amount of work. Um, so I think they're, they're very different people. They're in very different contexts. But, you know, I think, you know, nobody would argue against the fact that the two geniuses operate in round about the same time. But I'm not very good at the who influenced who. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry. No, and it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the four, because I, I, I don't know, but, you know, if you see Macintosh's work, like uh, The House of an Art Lover, uh, I, I, it amazes me how he can, you know, have this very delicate work, you know, that, that feels, I don't know, so elegant. And then there's you know, the, the art school that has a completely different uh, feeling to it. Uh, and you can see his style, but the feeling that the buildings give you is completely different. And no. I think that tells you how he thought of the purpose of each building and how they were going to be used and lived. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that there's another reading, there's another kind of interpretation, which is probably, you know, a, a 21st century look back at, the influence of his wife, Margaret Mac Macintosh. I, I think that shouldn't be underestimated. 
She was a hugely talented artist in her own, and designer in her own right. And they were a very, very close couple. Um, if you read his letters to her, you, you, know, you would understand just that they were complete soulmates. So I, I think in terms of his sensibility, I think Margaret MacDonald was a huge influence. And I think you can see her influence through um, his architecture. Yeah, totally. And there, there's some restoration being done as well, or like a protective shield or something, right? Around the, the house we're not over, I, I believe. I uh, no, that's actually, it's Hill House, which ah, is a Hill different house today. Yeah. So House for Art Lovers is within the Glasgow kind of yeah. um, area. Hill House, which is down in, it's down the river, down the River Clyde, it's in Helensborough. And that's the one that's they've built a cage oh, over no. it, a, a weatherproof cage to protect um, the building uh, while they restore it. But the thing is that the, the architects who designed the cage have made such a fantastic, it says it's a roof with um, kind of wire walls to let the wind blow through it. It's been so successful that people are starting to question whether they should keep the cage because it does allow you to move up through the building, the outside of the building. There's a walkway that takes you across the roof of the building so you can see it in its totality. So that's a debate that's happening. But if you ever come to Scotland, then Hill House, in its present state, Hill House is a, a must anyway, but in its present state with this armature around it is really quite, you know, it's stunning. Yeah, I, I would love to, you know, like go to every single building. I've tried, every time I go, I try to, to, <laughs> to visit another one you know i've been to the to the public school uh, yeah that was great as well yeah i i uh, i'm a huge fan so i try to you know be there and feel the buildings every time i i go back because yeah i really admire what macintosh could do in terms of the experience that it gives you to to walk around his buildings it's yeah. amazing how he can connect with the emotional part of you that's, I, I think that's where the genius is, you know, to be able to connect with the, with the audience. Yeah, I mean, I think we talk to our students in the world of Pinterest and, you know, the internet. You know, ar architecture is experienced through the body. You know, it's a visceral experience. And you've really got to, you've got to walk through the front door to really get what the building's about. Great. Thank you so much for this. I was like so happy throughout the whole lecture. I was like, oh, uh, as I told you, I was feeling like I was walking through the corridors again, and, but understanding everything in a much deeper way. So thank you so much for this. It was brilliant. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I mean, I think these talks and, you know, we're keeping the building alive by doing these things. We're the kind of um, life support machine until it comes back into being. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a good analogy. Yeah, let's let's do that. Let's keep it alive for as long as we can. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience before we go? Um, no, I'd just like to give a, an open invitation to come to, to Scotland, come to Glasgow, and um, sometime in the future walk through the front doors of the restored Glasgow School of Art. Thank you. Let, let's hope it's that way. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to um, talk about this wonderful building. It was great. If you have any questions or want to be a guest in the show, please let us know. Thank you for joining us today. We are your hosts, Tania Fuentes and Alba Sasueta. Until next time, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. We Chats is produced by the Sinanto Society of Mexico. Our staff also includes Tania Fuentes, Alba Sasueta, and Andres Gast. Our team song is The Soup of Good Drink, and this and the rest of the music is performed by Andres Castro and Brenda Speed. You can follow WeChat's Facebook page and listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Breaker, Anchor, or wherever you get your podcast. You can also get the entire archive in any podcast app. If you like the show, please recommend it to friends and family. That's the single best way to support the podcast that you love. Thanks for listening. <laughs>